Good morning. <laughs> I'm Lynn Baker, and it's my pleasure to welcome all of you on behalf of the Office of Human Resources and President Hanlon. It's wonderful to see many of you here as we gather to celebrate the legacy and birthday of Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. I hope that you've been enjoying the great food provided by the, Han <coughs> excuse me, by the Hanover Inn and that you have the chance to meet other colleagues from across campus. This year marks the eighth time that we have provided this breakfast as an opportunity for staff and faculty to come together to recognize the work and the legacy of Dr. King and also to contemplate and reflect on Dartmouth's commitment to diversity and inclusion and what we can all do within our own workplace, <coughs> excuse me, and roles at Dartmouth to appreciate difference and make our workplace and our community welcoming to all. Before I turn it over to my colleague, Gabrielle Luke, who will introduce today's featured speaker, Professor Denise Anthony, I'm delighted to introduce a Dartmouth alum and former employee who is currently a member of the Tuck School of Business Class of 2016, Caitlin Sheehan Ramirez, who will perform Lift Every Voice and Sing. Please join me in welcoming Caitlin Sheehan Ramirez, Class of 09, and a member of the Dartmouth Gospel Choir. the song twice and you have lyrics in front of you so feel free to join me on the second go round. <laughs> Lift every voice and sing till earth and heaven ring. Ring with the harmonies of liberty. Let our rejoicing rise high as the listening skies let it resound loud as the rolling sea sing a song full of the faith that the dark past has taught us sing a song full of the hope that the present has brought us Facing the rising sun of our new day begun, let us march on till victory is won. <clears throat> Lift every voice and sing till earth and heaven ring, ring with the harmony. Let our rejoicing rise high as the listening skies. Let it resound loud as the rolling sea. Sing a song full of the faith that the dark past has taught us. Sing a song full of the hope that the present has brought us. Facing the rising sun of our new day begun, let us march on till victory is won. Thank you. Thank you, Lynn and Caitlin. Um, Caitlin, I appreciate that you share your gift with us in times of joy and also times of remembrance. So thank you for that continued. I have the pleasure, and I can't even begin to tell you how excited I am about today, um, to introduce Denise Anthony, adjunct professor for community and family medicine, faculty affiliate, and the past director of the Institute for Security, Technology, and Society, 
faculty affiliate with the Dartmouth Institute for Public Policy and Clinical Practice, and most exciting, her new title as a member of the leadership of our institution as the vice let me make sure I get this right, Vice Provost for Academic Initiatives, and she continues to be a professor of psychology here. Sociology. <laughs> there we go. So I've just broke the ice, so anything from here on is good. Excellent. <laughs> Woo. All right, Denise is a professor and past chair in 2007 to 11 in the Department of Sociology at Dartmouth College. From 2008 to 2013, she was the research director of the Institute for Security, Technology, and Society, ISTS, at Dartmouth. Dr. Anthony's work explores issues of cooperation, trust, and privacy in a variety of settings, from healthcare delivery to microcredit borrowing groups to online groups such as Wikipedia and Prosper.com. Her current work examines the use of information technology in healthcare, including the effects on quality on the organization of healthcare, as well as the implications for the privacy and security protection of health information. Her multidisciplinary research has been funded by grants from the National Science Foundation and others, and published in sociology as well as public health policy and computer science journals, including, among others, the American Sociological Review, Social Science and Medicine, Journal of American Medical Association, Health Affairs, and the IEEE Pervasive Computing. And now I'll go off script. Could be scary for some folks in the audience. <laughs> um, on, on a personal note, my experience with Dr. Anthony actually started with our students. I supervised a group of students um, who were freshmen through seniors. And some of the upperclassmen were talking to the first year students like as I walked into our staff meeting. And their comment was like, oh my god, you have to take a sociology class with Dr. Anthony. Like it is the best, smartest thing you will ever do here because she really listens and she pays attention. And I think when we look at our theme this year uh, of finding voice in a whisper, I think Denise is someone who does that on day-to-day -day operations as well as when she's in front of a classroom or leading a group. One of my most poignant and memorable experiences here at Dartmouth is Professor Anthony agreed to be the moderator of a community lunch panel that we held a few years back. We brought together four members, uh, Dartmouth alums, who had gone down south to do voter registration. And this group of four men came together for the first time with other people who had shared that experience. During their panel discussion, Dr. Anthony so gently and poignantly guided them through discussion, gave these gentlemen an opportunity to share and to talk about life experiences that they had that they had never spoken about before. Their wives were weeping in the audience because they learned new information about their husband's histories. That's what Dr. Anthony can do, is provide safe and secure environments for people on the dais with her, as well as for those of us that are working out in the cyber world. So it was a great honor and a tremendous thrill to introduce Professor Denise Anthony. Wow, thank you so much. And what Gabrielle very kindly did not say was that I was weeping up there too, <laughs> completely choked up. Um, well, good morning. It is um, such an honor to be here today to speak um, this morning on a day that we honor Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. for his work on social justice and racial equality. Um, I think it really means something that we take this whole day, the whole month, and hopefully the whole year to think about and pause and reflect on the ideals that Dr. King championed but more importantly, to consider what they mean today in our own lives as in a, and in our own society and what we're going to do about them today. So in thinking about what I could talk about today, I looked at some of the past speakers. And this is a great thing. You can do that, too. You can look on the Dartmouth website and find <laughs> last year's fabulous talk by Dr. Ella Bell Smith. Um, and it, even if you don't do that, fortunately, she's our speaker, our keynote speaker this year. So you can go see her live tonight, which I highly recommend. 
But last year, she talked about her experience as a young girl from the Bronx traveling for the first time to the South and experiencing a segregated bathroom and what that felt like. The year before, um, the year before that, my colleague, Professor Bruce Dutu from Native American Studies, spoke about his experiences in a segregated um, New Orleans in which Indian children like him were excluded from public schools and what that felt like to grow up in a society where that exclusion was allowed and encouraged and legal. So those personal stories of systematic discrimination and exclusion because of race and ethnicity, and that's the reason we're gonna celebrate Martin Luther King um, and his work and the work of the entire civil rights movement to break down those unjust institutions and practices, they're incredibly important for us to think about. And so I, I thought something I could do today is remind us of some of the ongoing examples of systematic inequality and injustice that we have in this country. For example, I could talk about that overall about 15% of the U.S. population lives in poverty. That's $12,000 a year for an individual, $24,000 a year for a family of four. But among blacks in America, black families, it's 27% live in poverty. Among Hispanics, it's 24% live in poverty. Among Native Americans, it's 25% live in poverty. Asian Americans, 15%, like the overall. But for whites, it's 10%. Living in poverty for everyone matters. But that tells us something. I could talk about unemployment rates, in which in the last quarter of 2014, overall unemployment rate was happily, finally, down to about 5.5%. For whites and Asian Americans, it's actually a little bit lower than 5%, while for blacks and Native Americans, it is over double the national unemployment rate, at over 10%. For Hispanics, it's 6.5%. Concerns about poverty and unemployment were as central to Dr. King's work for social justice as was his work on racial equality. So many of you will recognize his famous quote from 1965 during the boycotts when he said, what good does it do to be able to eat at a lunch counter if you can't afford to buy the hamburger? I could talk about our incarceration rates in the US, a topic much discussed in recent years. Since with more than two million people incarcerated, we have the highest incarceration rates in the world. But more problematic than that is the differential racial incarceration rate. According to the Prison Policy Initiative's analysis of census data, blacks are incarcerated five times the rate of whites, while Hispanics are incarcerated two times the rate for whites. Finally, I could talk about our levels of racial segregation in housing. Some recent research by ge social geographers shows us that the US is less segregated now than at any point in the last century. That's good news, and frankly, how could it not be true? <laughs> but it actually depends on the scale at which you measure it. And so as we move down from the overall society to the city or the, certainly the neighborhood level, we see stark levels of racial segregation in how we live continuing today. So as you can see, sociologists like me could talk forever about population statistics and rates. And it's because they are important for us to understand and get a sense of what the social conditions are in our society. Um, but what about the personal story, like the stories my colleagues told us in the past about their experiences of exclusion and discrimination? So for that, to talk about my own experience, we need to talk about something that can be, I think, um, certainly harder for some of us, probably many of us in this room, to talk about. And that is to talk about privilege, white privilege which is the flip side of discrimination and disadvantage. So what do we mean by the term white privilege? Using the term privilege means to acknowledge both the lack of disadvantages as well as the actual advantages of being white 
in a majority white country with a history of racial and ethnic discrimination against people of color. Some of you may be very familiar with the term, if not the concept, of white privilege, while others may not be familiar with it at all. So let me begin first, though, by saying what white privilege is not. White privilege does not mean that people with white skin get some kind of direct benefits, money, resources, jobs, grades, automatically because they are white. Some of you who are white may be sitting there thinking, hey, no one ever gave me anything because I am white. I've had to work hard every day for everything I have. Life is not easy for me or people I know just because my skin is white. All true. Every person in our community, every person at Dartmouth, no matter their race or ethnicity, gender, background, religion, etc., every person had to work hard to get here and works hard every day in our community. But here I can talk a little bit about my own background. I grew up in central Pennsylvania in a big, mostly Irish Catholic family with some strong German on my father's side. My parents didn't go to college, nor did 27 of my 30 aunts and uncles did not go to college. Um, don't get me started about my 50 first cousins. <laughs> Um, I grew up solidly working class um, in a small working class city. I worked very hard to get to and get through college, to go to graduate school, and I, like you, try to work hard every day of my life and certainly did not grow up feeling like I or most of the people I knew or in my family had some kind of advantage in life. But here's an important but subtle part of what privilege means that we need to recognize. And here I can again quote Dr. King from a speech in 1967 in which he said, quote, the powerful never lose opportunities. They remain available to them. The powerless, on the other hand, never experience opportunity. It is always arriving at a later time. Now, what does this have to do with white privilege? with me, a working class girl from Altoona, Pennsylvania. I can tell you that girl certainly did not feel like one of the powerful in Dr. King's quote, but it is true that the opportunities okay. remained available to me. And while we might now recognize that because of the work of Dr. King and so many people during the civil rights movement, that the powerless are no longer explicitly legally blocked from experiencing opportunity, we still have racism and racial differences that we have to acknowledge and confront. And this is where the idea of white privilege can be helpful in thinking not only about the extreme and serious aspects of racism, like police violence against black men, but also about the small, subtle privileges that extend to white people and why they matter. In a famous article about white privilege from the 1980s, Peggy McIntosh, a women's studies scholar from Wellesley, enumerated all of the privileges of being white that she experienced on a daily basis. And the first thing she identifies is this, quote, I can, if I wish, arrange to be in the company of people of my own race most of the time. For many white people, this is an idea they have never considered or even recognized because they don't have to. It is simply true that white people can go pretty much anywhere they choose to go or would like to go, including up into the upper echelons of power in any industry or organization we can think of and be in the company of others of their own race. Frankly, look around. But for others of us, this may be rarely true, and especially so in elite places like Dartmouth. Again, look around, see our colleagues. I can return to my younger self, that hardworking, working class girl, and I can describe for you the first time I experienced being in the minority. During my sophomore year of college, I lived in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, the big city, to work. 
I didn't have a fancy job or internship. I actually worked three different part-time jobs that summer. And so here I was, I found myself on one of my first mornings on a bus at 5.30 a.m. from the Oakland neighborhood of Pittsburgh, um, heading into downtown to the bakery job I had found there. And I realized I was the only white person on the bus. Everyone else was African American. Now the bus wasn't packed or crowded. It was just maybe about a dozen other people like me who were on their way to work, reading, sitting with their coffee, but I can remember realizing that I had never experienced being in the minority before. But I also remember thinking, I'd taken a few sociology classes by then, um, <laughs> that probably everyone else on the bus experienced that feeling every day. I had grown up with plenty of Szymanskis, Fraundorfers, Ruggeries, uh, Lubranos, um, but I hadn't grown up with any Rodriguez's or Lee's or Washington's, to use a bunch of stereotypical names, but to imply the, the differences here. Now, why does this matter? Some of you may be thinking, especially some of you who are white, so what? So you were the only white person on the bus every morning. Who cares? It doesn't really matter for anything, which in some ways is true. It certainly did not affect the availability of opportunities to me, like King said. But so why is the ability to always be among your own race a privilege for white people? It is because of how this privilege is then closely related to two other issues. First, it means that those who are a minority within a community have to work harder and be more purposeful about being around others of their own racial or ethnic group. Second, it means that those in the minority not only are already more aware of race because of this, it took me one or two mornings on the bus to be aware of this, but they have to pay more attention to race if they want to be with other people sometimes of their own race and ethnicity. So this often leads to comments that you might have heard white people say, things like, look, I don't think about race. I don't understand why we have to talk about race all the time. Or how about this one? Why do all the black kids sit together? They are self-segregating. And so this privilege here is that white people don't have to pay attention to race, but still benefit from being in that majority. They don't have to do anything at all. And yet when other groups either talk about race or seek out increased representation of people like them, white people, like me, can say, why are you so fixated on race? Another aspect of privilege is recognizing how whiteness is the norm and operates across society from the mundane to the serious, right? What does this mean? A very seemingly mundane example described in a number in Peggy McIntosh's and others who've written about white privilege that in some ways is so trivial, but it's why we have to talk about it because it affects your day-to-day -day life. And especially for the women in the room, I'm talking about hair care products. Imagine, do this little thought experiment, you are in a city for a job interview, staying at a hotel and you discover you've forgotten your shampoo or other hair care products. And when you look at the complimentary shampoo available, you see what? Of course, I see the product that is fine for me, right? But not if you are African American. So if you are white, imagine what it might be like to see shea butter or Carol's daughter's shampoo or something else sitting there and you think, where is the suave? <laughs> I can't use that. I, I don't even know what to do with that. So then you think, okay, I've got this job interview. I, I'm gonna go to the local CVS to find my suave. But not only is the suave not in the shampoo section, it isn't even in the separate, much smaller section labeled ethnic products. <laughs> now what do I do? Right? I've got a really personal problem. I've got to be ready for my job interview tomorrow. 
but what this, this is a signal about how I fit in the world. Now imagine that that isn't just in the unknown city where you are for an interview. What if it happens to be in the place where you live? And I can tell you, when I moved to Hanover, New Hampshire, I had lots of misgivings and worries about coming to a small rural place, coming to northern New England. One thing that it never occurred to me to worry about is, will I be able to find someone who knows how to cut my hair? This little thought experiment is just one of many we could do to recognize how our society, our local worlds, are structured around whiteness as the norm. And of course, lots of other things matter here. Economics, demographic patterns, marketing, et cetera, et cetera. I'm not denying all of those processes, which of course happen to be intertwined with race and ethnicity in our country too. But I'm only trying to recognize, like Peggy McIntosh, how whiteness can operate like a privilege in my day-to-day -day life. Now, I'm also talking about things that aren't just so mundane and trivial as shampoo and hair care products. So why am I talking about these issues? Why am I further arguing that we need to pay attention to white privilege? There are at least three reasons why being aware of white privilege is important. But before I get to them, I, I want to say explicitly what these reasons are not. A reason to talk about and acknowledge white privilege is not to make white people defensive. It is not to make people like me say, but wait a minute, I didn't grow up with money, I didn't grow up with resources, I work hard, life is hard for me too, life is hard for people I know, they don't get anything given to them. Or sometimes women, white women will say, look, women are discriminated against too, right? Of course, white privilege isn't the only kind of privilege. Class, gender, physical ability, sexuality, etc., are all dimensions of privilege. So the idea of talking about privilege is not in order to create a ledger on which we count the, the advantages and disadvantages. It's simply to acknowledge the privilege. A related issue is that talking about white privilege is not to make white people feel guilty. Your guilt does not, my guilt doesn't help anyone or the situation. You don't need to uh, apologize to people of color for benefiting from the status quo. Apologies, guilt, do not get us anywhere. More importantly, apology and guilt is very different from recognizing and acknowledging privilege. That's what we need to do. So if acknowledging privilege is not to make white people feel defensive or guilty, why is it important? First, acknowledging privilege allows us to recognize that the status quo in which whiteness is the norm creates some benefits for white people and challenges for people of color, whether the seemingly mundane, described earlier about hair care products, up to the much more serious, and here I'll plug like those described in Claudia Rankine's new book, Citizen, that I highly recommend. The great 20th century sociologist, W.E.B. Du Bois, called this the psychological wage of racism. Today, psychologists will talk about microaggressions related to white privilege. Microaggressions are defined as brief and commonplace daily verbal, behavioral, and environmental indignities, whether intentional or unintentional, that communicate hostile, derogatory, or negative racial slights and insults toward people of color. A few examples of microaggressions that typically stem from occupying the status quo of whiteness are comments like the following, and these came from a Twitter feed, um, hashtag microaggressions. Quote, so where do you really come from? Quote, I don't see you as a black guy. Quote, you don't really seem Asian. 
quote, oh, I thought you were white. You sound white. Second reason, acknowledging privilege is necessary to move toward change. If we, white people, do not ex acknowledge the way we benefit from the current status quo, then it continues to be a lot more difficult to move forward. We do not and cannot move to a more equal and just society with the attitude that everything can stay the same. We'll just bring some of the people into the status quo. In addition, it means being able to see people as individuals, as complete human beings, as ends in themselves rather than as representatives of their race. So for example, today, if I do a great job up here, and I say the jury's still out, <laughs> no one is going to say or even think, wow, good for that white girl. <laughs> she is so articulate. What a testament to her race. <laughs> and of course, if I do a terrible job, no one is going to say or think, why do they always have to talk about race? Those people are never satisfied. Now, this is very much related to the third and most important, maybe, reason for acknowledging and confronting privilege. And it brings me back to Martin Luther King Jr., who I'm now going to read a section from his letter from the Birmingham jail, an extended section. Dr. King writes, I must confess that over the last few years, I have been gravely disappointed with the white moderate. I have almost reached the regrettable conclusion that the Negro's great stumbling block in the stride toward freedom is not the white citizen counselor or the Ku Klux Klanner, but the white moderate who is more devoted to order than to justice, who prefers a negative peace, which is the absence of tension, to a positive peace, which is the presence of justice who constantly says, I agree with you in the goal you seek, but I can't agree with your methods of direct action, who paternalistically feels that he can set the timetable for another man's freedom, who lives by the myth of time, and who constantly advises the Negro to wait until a more convenient season. Shallow understanding from people of goodwill is more frustrating than absolute misunderstanding from people of ill will. Lukewarm acceptance is much more bewildering than outright rejection. We will have to repent in this generation, not merely for the vitriolic words and actions of the bad people, but for the appalling silence of the good people. We must come to see that human progress never rolls in on wheels of inevitability. It comes through the tireless efforts and persistent work of men and women willing to be co-workers with God. And without this hard work, time itself becomes an ally of the forces of social stagnation." End quote. Now, of course, King was writing his letter in 1963, but I think we can actually apply these words pretty directly to our own time. Um, when you think of Ferguson to the high incarceration rates to the poverty and unemployment, human progress never rolls in on wheels of inevitability. Without the tireless and persistent hard work of men and women like us, time becomes an ally of the status quo. Let us follow in King's footsteps and be challengers of the status quo. And in the words of Reverend Starsky Wilson, who I hope many of you got to see in one of his many talks, it is time for us, for all of us, to show up. Thank you.
Thank you, Professor Anthony. At this point, I'm just going to, there's a lot of people we have some gratitude that we want to pass on to. First of all, thank all of you for forging the weather, the ice, <laughs> and all else you may have faced this morning to join us. Um, this is one of the few times that we really do get to gather in community, um, regardless of what our statute or role is here, and, and it really is a, a precious moment um, for us to come together and to think and to celebrate who we are, but then also to think of where are we taking this institution? So thank you all for coming out this morning. I'd like to again thank Caitlin and Lynn um, for helping us with opening up the event. Um, our trusty table of volunteers in the back who are a group of human resources employees who always say yes, regardless of what the job is or what needs to be done. And I'd like if we could have a round of applause for our team in the back there. I'd also like to thank the Hanover Inn team. So once again, for a lovely adventure. Um, I, I have to say, this event would not have happened this year. Um, and I am also personally grateful for her putting up with my mania. But Miranda Bergmeier has really been our logistics coordinator and um, a true asset as this event transitioned between hands. So thank you, Miranda. And my final thank you goes out to the Institutional Diversity and Equity and the conferences and special events um, for your leadership in arranging not only this program, but all that we get exposed to for the next several weeks and hopefully throughout the year. Um, there's so much behind the scenes work that goes on um, with these people who are often invisible to all of us. And I, I would like to, if we can have members of both IDE and conferences and special events, please stand. And we'll give you some gratitude for all we're going to experience in the next few weeks. So. so be kind to these people when you see them outside events over the next two weeks. But um, again, thank you all. Please enjoy the rest of your visit together. Um, and I hopefully you met a new colleague as well as got to reconnect with some folks that you have some history with. Thank you. <laughs>